<clears throat> All right, we are live. Hi, this is uh, John Reed uh, with another edition of Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio, the only Enterprise uh, talk show without a sponsor. Never going to have a sponsor. Never will have a sponsor. <laughs> Woohoo! Free open discussions. And look who I got in the hot seat. I got Nicole France of Constellation Research. What's going on? Oh, man, I got to say, John, I love the seven up of Enterprise uh, software discussion. It's good. I dig yes. It. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Nicole has to take a brief break to promote uh, the broadcast because of how I have it set up. But in the meantime, I'll just explain to you guys a couple of things here. We're going to be talking about CX uh, projects and problems. Uh, we're going to do a couple of really cool things. We're going to do a countdown of Nicole's most hated CX buzzwords, which I'm sure was a tough list to compile. We're also going to do a countdown of the top five keys to successful CX projects, which should be really fun. And uh, I'm going to play along, too. I've got mine prepared also. So it'll be very interesting to see if if Nicole and I actually agree on any of our – I know there's one buzzword in particular that I think we agree on, but will it make the list? I mean, that's – there's a lot of buzzwords to consider here. So uh, will the one I'm thinking of actually make the final list? That's, that's going to be an interesting question. Um, so one of the rules of my broadcasts, uh, as, as those of you who have started following these know – is that you're welcome to comment at any time, and we're probably going to interrupt whatever's happening to address your comment, as long as it's on topic. So, uh, <laughs> I know there's a couple of diehard ERP folks that have been showing up. So, don't be disappointed. We're not here to talk ERP today. No, we got to talk customers. And I got to say, John, I'm having trouble finding the link on LinkedIn to promote it. Oh, the link is not there, huh? Nope. Hmm. Well, well maybe it. maybe I'm not even live on LinkedIn. That'd be a real bummer. One that with one would think that I was, but uh, oh well. Um, let me just check for a sec and see. Um, in the meantime, while I am checking, let me turn it over to you. I think before we do much, we need to talk about the word CX because um, we've kind of accepted it into the vernacular, but maybe you should put the brakes on that for a moment and and compare like how did we get to CX from CRM? And, and does that mean that CRM is gone? Like, like how do you think about that? Oh, that, I mean, it's too bad Paul Greenberg is not on because we could start up a little uh, celebrity death match on this. I mean, by the way, I think we should bring back the claymation celebrity death match from MTV. I don't know if anybody remembers those days, but there's plenty of room for that in this enterprise customer experience, enterprise software and technology space. Um, but yeah, how how did we get here to customer experience? I certainly don't think CRM is dead, but I think it's uh, one of those situations where the fundamental meaning of the term is very much what it has always been, customer relationship management. But the understanding of the technology has really changed quite significantly over the last couple of decades. And what is definitely the case is that Companies, I think, need to change their mindset about how they interact with their customers and how they design for customer relationships throughout the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about customer experience, uh, and John, I know you've heard me say this multiple times, I like to define CX as an enterprise-wide team sport. And I see that as the principles and practices of <laughs> new customers at the center of a successful business. And the reason is pretty simple. If you've got great customer relationships, if they're if the customer experience is good and is consistently good, I think that's the basis of really durable customer relationships and a sustainable business. So, you know, there I'm certainly not the only one saying this. I think the idea of being customer centric or however you want to articulate it is really very much a high priority. It's not just a vogue, I think it's actually a really central point of digital transformation these days. And it's certainly something that this year in the face of a global pandemic and all of the economic repercussions of that has really come to the fore. So it is about changing that mindset. It's about changing processes. It's about rethinking the tools and technologies that we use in order to make that happen really effectively. Right. <clears throat> So, uh, Josh Greenbaum's already in the game here. Claymation Deathmatch, are we talking vendor versus vendor? Can analysts get in on the game too? Uh, Josh, you can absolutely get in on the game here. You can act, in fact, you can play along when we get to the, 
the uh, most hated CX buzzwords, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Nicole, I did want to mention I pasted the uh, link in the chat there uh, for you to pimp out. It looks like it went out to all the channels that I'm broadcasting on. If you guys see that, um, LinkedIn is probably the most fun place to watch. So feel free to go over to LinkedIn, but you can comment from anywhere. Uh, I can see you there. <clears throat> uh, and uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I think for our purposes today, we're not, I'm not going to sweat the, uh, the definitions of all of this too much. What, what I'm basically going to do is just say like, that we'll accept what Nicole is describing as far as CX is concerned. And as far as CRM, we'll kind of umbrella that in. If you want to bring in call center, that's fine. It's more about, I think, the different mentality that, that Nicole is describing more than anything. And, and yeah, I think it's also that broader umbrella, right, where you're thinking about marketing, you're thinking about service, you're thinking about the fact that all these things are basically connected, right? And don't, and, and don't forget sales. I mean, sales. Sales. Well, sales was always there, right? But sales yeah. comes along too. Uh, if the salespeople don't like your your shit, you're screwed. So they they have to be part of this. <laughs> well, and, you so. know, and the interesting thing is, I think part of the challenge with CRM is that if we look at CRM systems, uh, that really has been a big misnomer. And that's probably a longer conversation than we have time for today, John, as I'm sure you know. But something yeah. to keep in mind, because I, I really do think what we're increasingly looking at and what the concept of customer experience helps us to recognize is that we really are talking about two sides of the same coin. On one side, the buyer's experience and the buyer's journey. And on the other side, it's really the seller's experience. And you can take that very broadly. You can look at that from a sales perspective, but you can look at that from a company-wide perspective too uh, and recognize that it's not just about driving a sale. It's about everything that comes before that and everything that comes after that. And hopefully, you know, the, the repeated loops that you go through because customers like what you do, they like working with you and they keep coming back. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, hey, your greetings, greetings as well. Uh, thanks for joining. While some of you watching are thinking of your most hated CX buzzwords, I'm going to ask Nicole probably the hardest question she's going to have to, to field today. Uh, um, unless I make reference to a recent industry event. No, I, I'm kidding, Nicole. Um, what I want to ask you is, I, in our industry, I think one of the challenges is that after a while, the analyst sort of title starts to get a little stale. It almost feels like we're all drinking from the same well and saying the same things. Um, and in the, in the pandemic, it's actually gotten, I think, harder in some ways to go get unique information because we're not able to kick tires quite the same way uh, virtually as when we went on site. Uh, I always like to say that I miss drunk customers more than anything, um, you know, because that's where I got my best information. But in all seriousness, um, I know you have access to some resources as part of Constellation as well, but how how do you arrive at kind of a unique view of the market that, that you feel like is yours and your voice? Like, how do you get that and how do you maintain that? It's a whole bunch of stuff, really. And I think there's there's kind of the, the set of inputs that I use and how I think. And the latter part is definitely me. And that's that's probably not ever going to change. Um, and it really is that kind of synthesis process that I think is distinctly me and distinctly my point of view. But I try to be very thoughtful about what I look for to form my opinions as well. So I do a lot of listening. I'm talking to a lot of people, but I'm really asking a lot of questions. As you know, it's one of my hobbies is asking questions. And that really spans a pretty broad range. Um, I like to talk to colleagues of mine, not necessarily other analysts at Constellation, although of course those folks as well, but other colleagues in the industry. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking with technology vendors and various kinds of constituents within those organizations. I spend a lot of time talking to the people that are actually doing this stuff. So my enterprise customers, and again, a wide range of job titles and roles, folks really who are, who are at the coal face, who are doing this stuff day to day, um, some of whom are incredibly thoughtful and who have really very impressive perspective on what they're doing too. And I think that's something that I really value a lot because it's often hard to 
think broadly about what you're doing when you're totally preoccupied by the day to day. Um, which by the way is a reason that I think we as analysts exist in this market. We have the luxury of doing that. Our jobs are really to work across the scope of all the available information. And we're not just clearing houses for information. We really have the job of synthesizing it and trying to make sense of it. So it's all the more impressive to me when I come across someone who's who's really focused on doing the stuff in the day to day and is also very articulate and has a, a, a broader perspective that they're able to describe that helps to encapsulate why they're doing what they're doing. So those are probably, for me, some of the biggest inputs. I try to read a lot as well. I'm never able to read as much as I would like to, but whether it's you know factual information out there that's really talking about technologies or trends or you know economic factors, but also quite honestly, ideas and thinking. Uh, so I went down a rabbit hole uh, a few months ago, for example, on um, systems thinking, which was pretty interesting in the whole concept of unified systems theory. So stuff like that, that for me is really critical for helping me frame my own thoughts um, and things that are actually sometimes really important sources of analogies that help to describe what I think is important as well. Mm. And are there any burning questions that are really driving your thinking this year? Are there a couple things that you're really seeking answers to right now? Or <sighs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think I bounce back and forth between being very, very focused on this idea of customers and really understanding customers and and thinking of them as individuals and understanding them as individuals. And on the other side, stuff that almost risks losing that, that concept altogether, which is really about systems and architectures and ways of organizing, uh, whether it's information or processes or uh, the interfaces that actually help us to do our jobs really effectively. So it's, it's those are those are the two things I say, I'd say that have been really big preoccupations for me this year. So how can you treat me like a human being and how can you do it at scale? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And how, how okay. you rationalize those things in a way that really makes sense and that is operationally and functionally possible. All right, well, we're gonna start into our most hated CX buzzwords and the rest of y'all can play along. Thomas, on your point uh, on why is CRM a misnomer, uh, if you'll indulge me, I don't really wanna have a, a conversation about CX versus CRM is definition. I, I, I'm just a little bored by that. I'm sorry. It's just me. I find, I find that boring. If you want to use the word CRM, that's totally fine. Um, we're just going to use the word CX today. <laughs> Maybe at the end of the uh, interview, we can, we can get to that uh, point because I don't want to totally overlook it, but it's just, it's just more about, I want to talk about how do we, how do companies serve customers better? Whatever the hell you want to call that um, is fine with me. So Sounds good. I've got thoughts on that. So we'll definitely come back to that. Okay, one. good. I, I will look forward to that then. Great. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Christmas came early, buddy. Um, <laughs> uh, the stocking is in the mail, dude. Um, I was going to say FedEx okay. is out. I don't have to do anything. But. All right. So, and I, I have asked Nicole to also try to rank these in order. So this really is kind of a best of countdown where, you know, remember American top 40 growing up, whatever number one was number one. So, all right, start with number four, your your most hated CX buzzword, Nicole. Four, I thought we were doing three, so I might have to do a little tap. Okay, okay, well, well, okay, we'll do, start start with um start with three, and, and then you'll think of one more. One I definitely more. will, there's okay. plenty to choose from. Okay, so starting from the, from the least, going to the most, okay, so, and if this was hard to choose, personalization. Oh, personalization, <laughs> nice. You like that one? Yep. 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 And why did that make your list? Well, here again, just going back to Thomas's com comment there, what a misnomer. I mean, okay, let's be clear. Personalization is important. Treating your customers as individuals and understanding and anticipating their needs is absolutely essential. The reason it makes my buzzword list is because it's so misused. It's atrocious. So what is personalization? If you're lucky, it's addressing you by name and actually getting your name right in most cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not really personalization. That's a salutation and that's great. But I think the problem that we have is that 
the the person has been missing in this concept of personalization in a whole lot of organizations and certainly in a lot of the technologies and the vendor pitches that are out there. It's if you notice, like go back and look at all of the pitches on personalization technology and there's almost no reference to actual customers in there. It's all about data. It's all about doing stuff at scale and it's very little about actual individual customers or even sometimes even mentioning the word customer period. Uh, Thomas, I'm not going to show your comment on the, on the video because I, I, I don't want to that would be a spoiler. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't want to do that yet. Uh, you're just going to have to hang in. Um, but, um, but yeah. And you know, one of, one of my big issues is that I think a lot of companies that are even doing this stuff, they, they can't resist the possibility that you might get looped in. So in other words, I just had an argument with a PR rep about this because I was saying that the reason the hotels are going to keep sending me generic non-personalized stuff is because they don't perceive a downside to it. So even if they could, they, they want to take a chance that, that I might go fishing and be amongst those 5% of, of people, analysts like me, that never take vacations at their hotels that I might choose to do so. So they're going to yeah. take that chance because they don't give a crap if it bothers me. And so personalization is a fraud. Um, anyway, um, we're going to get back to that. So, <laughs> well, we will. So, um, so anyway, here's my number four in this one. You might be surprised, Nicole, that I didn't save this one for even higher up. And I have props here. CDP. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I gotta say, this was, this was the one that I didn't have on my list because I thought it was okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll call this your number four then. Okay. So so we have a match. I have a I have a bell for that. Let's see if we can do it. That's a match. Um, and uh, yes, Nicole and I both can't stand the word CDP. Nicole, I will let you tee off on CDP. Oh man, and I wrote a book. which is customer data platform by the way. Platform. I I'm wrote let, let you tee off on this. <laughs> I wrote a blog post about this a while ago about why I'm a CDP skeptic. And I think, again, we get really good at coming up with these categories, coming up with these terms. And if you parse out what the terminology, what the words actually mean and what together they ought to mean, they totally make sense. OK, you want a platform. You want one place where you can manage your customer data effectively. Sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, who doesn't want that? The reality, however, and the reality of what characterizes most of the CDP offerings on the market is really not that. First of all, it's not one thing. It's not one thing that's going to address all of your requirements around customer data. If you're lucky, it will do it well for certain use cases, probably only in marketing. But the problem is, especially if you buy into this idea of customer experience as a team sport across the enterprise, a whole lot of other parts of the business actually need to be able to use that customer information consistently as well. We need we need a consistent view of our customers. And if it only helps meet the needs for part of the organization, it is not solving the problem. So I, yeah, I mean, we could spend a whole hour on this, John, I'm sure, and we don't need to today. But yeah, I've got a real beef with CDPs. Not, not well, the term, the actual practical reality of what's in the market. Well, and also just the marketing issues, because now that every vendor claims to have this, I think it makes it very, very difficult for customers to understand uh, which platforms are more mature, which are ready to handle their data challenges. Um, I think it's just creating as much confusion as, as anything. So anyway, uh, vet, I'm sure that customers are going to be encountering this term a lot at events for the rest of the year and into the next year. I don't know about you, John, but I'm actually finding organizations that have multiple CDPs, which maybe is not ludicrous if you really start looking at what it oh. is to do, but you know, contradiction in terms. Anyway. Customer data platforms. That is just, that sounds just like a nightmare. And, and who's going to tie those together? Uh, ooh, that, that sounds brutal. Mark, glad you like the format. I know I was talking with you about this the other day. Uh, I, I have blatantly stolen this format from other genres, music and sports, basically. I'm applying it to the enterprise because I think enterprise video has gotten really boring and I'm going to change that single-handedly. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, the countdown format is going to be a factor in a, in a lot of my future shows. So anyhow, thanks, Mark. And with that in mind, shall we go to uh, number, let's see, what number are we on now? We're on, well, are we? 
Count my personalization as three and we go to your number three, John. Does that work? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, right. my number three. Now, this term isn't totally widely used yet, um, but I think it encompasses a lot of stuff that's going to bother the crap out of me, which is intelligent CX. <laughs> so I, I ran into this one in a PR email the other day. And my first question is, if intelligent CX is here, then does that mean that everyone else is doing unintelligent CX up until this point? So that's the first thing, because I guess we're pretty dumb. Um, yeah. But I just want to read you a little bit from a blog post that I that I read about intelligent CX. Connecting systems data in teams, the intelligent customer experience. Are you ready for this? It delivers a seamless CX from one brand touch point to the next. It reduces friction in the customer journey. Intelligent CX leads to better customer engagement. It increases profits. It grows brand loyalty. And it even makes frogs rain from the sky. Actually, that part wasn't on there. Um, <laughs> that was the most believable part. Yeah, guiding a customer towards conversion and long-term engagement. Lifelong brand advocates embrace intelligent CX. So anyway. I just um, want to tell you that as a customer, the thing that I always have front of mind is that I really want to convert. You know, that's, that is my next big goal is converting um, and becoming a lifelong brand advocate. I don't know about you, but in most of my, you know, customer activity as a consumer, these are really the things that are shaping my decisions and my actions. Is that true for you too? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, very rarely, very yeah, rarely. Like, on, this is ludicrous. Like this is part of the problem with a whole bunch of this stuff. It's like, okay, aside from the fact that, by implication, any other kind of CX is stupid. I mean, what the hell does that mean for a customer? Mm. I, I understand improving operationally what we're trying to do internally and improving collaboration, including, including information and data sharing, but so what? So what? What's the point of doing that if it doesn't have a positive impact on the customer? And it might even be a positive impact in ways the customer is not necessarily consciously aware of but if it's not doing that why bother and what makes that better okay we got a couple interesting questions <clears throat> I like david's question here very interesting perspective about the term personalization how would you call a true execution of customer centric experiences with best fit content and messaging i mean david i i, I struggle a little bit with the question because there's a lot of jargon in there um, but I think what you're talking about is how, how to make customers' lives better and can personalization play a role in that? And I'll, I'll just answer quickly. I think it can, but I just think it, you have to be a lot more realistic about what the limits are of that and, and what that means on a per customer basis for your company. But Nicole, what would you say? Well, I'd say a couple of things. One is, and I get where the question is going. Um, I think what, what, this question is really describing is contextually appropriate interactions. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I think the goal is here. And when, when the interactions that we have with our customers are contextualized and appropriate, yeah, they feel personal because they're anticipating what I as a, a customer wanna do at that particular point in that particular mode or with those particular priorities that I have at a moment in time. And what I'm getting back responds to those signals that I've been sending. And that does feel, I wouldn't necessarily call it personalized, but it's right. It's it's exactly what I want to experience at that moment in time. And that facilitates my relationship. It might smooth the way for a transaction. It, at a minimum, will improve communication. So all of these things are absolutely the goal. It's just that I think we, again, we have a tendency to turn this into these very sort of systematized understandings of what happens on the back end without really connecting that to what is the expectation of the customer on the front end. And if we're if we're actually getting this right, it's personalized in the sense that it is tailored for what that customer wants at that moment. And we've done a really good job of anticipating that. Um, but it's not personalized in the sense of feeling like weirdly intimate or inappropriate or assuming a level of closeness in a relationship that doesn't really exist. Right. And, and I think part, part of the challenge here, right, is that what you're referring to, I think, is a worthy goal, which is this notion of contextual experiences, which is a really brutal phrase. But what the idea being that 
that my context changes constantly. And if you're a brand, you would like to anticipate that context and you would like to serve that as it changes. And the problem, of course, is that it can change very frequently. Yep. And 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 your your priorities can change very frequently during the course of just a day, right? Um, you, you could start the day checking your Amazon orders, and then there's one thing you need uh, for supper, and then you realize that you're not going to be able to cook supper. So now you're thinking about delivery. Um, meanwhile, the contextual experience thing is serving up boots because you bought boots last week, but you don't need boots anymore. And I and would, so yeah, I bought I bought a knife rack a few weeks ago, and the company I bought the knife rack from is now trying to app, offer me other knife storage solutions. I bought it. Yeah. I'm done. I'm good. I don't yeah, you're not you're knife. not trying to become a ninja, right? Like you're, you've got the knives that you need. Exactly. So so anyway, I think I I do actually think it is a worthy goal. I just think it it it's it's more of an overstated thing, and a and and the phrases used to describe it drive me nuts. But I, I'm not saying it's a bad goal. Um, no, no, and, um, and and Thomas is Thomas. You are proving to be an excellent curmudgeon <laughs> in the chat, uh, and I mean that in the best of ways. Um, and then he adds, uh, intelligently or not. Um, so I think this is a great question. I think you know this is a fundamental philosophy of customer relationships and customer experience. Uh, the short answer, well, let me let me come at this two ways. The experience is always personal and it is always driven by the recipient. So in that sense, it's really not about software, it's about something that is deeply human. Having said that, there are certainly experiences, there are interactions that are absolutely managed by software that can be a really essential part of delivering what is ultimately a positive customer experience. Certainly a customer experience, but you know, let's aim let's aim high here, let's aim for some positive customer experiences. I'll give you an example. So as you know, John, I live on an island. Every now and then I have to go to the mainland a lot less often lately. So we went to the mainland because we were going on a trip. We hadn't driven the car and we figured out after the fact, like three months. So we get to the mainland, we get to the car and we had just enough battery to unlock the doors and get in, but not enough to actually start the engine. So you know, it was the call into AAA. Call into AAA, and as I'm on the phone, AAA texts me a link so that I can actually go and make my request on their bot on their website. Uh, if if that was going to be a better way of getting to a resolution for me, so I was like, great. I don't want to wait in line, waiting to talk. You know, wait in the queue to talk to an agent to tell them that I need to send out someone to give us a jump on the on the battery. So I did use the use the bot. Bam, seconds later, dispatch in. I could track the technician as they were coming to where we were parked to give us the, the jump. Technician was great. That software delivered me a fantastic customer experience. And it was actually above and beyond what I was expecting. I use that example frequently because it was extremely positive. So in that sense, yes. But the thing I will say is, Software alone is not going to do it. It takes some real human intelligence and some human thoughtfulness to figure out how to use that software really effectively in which context for which needs and how to very quickly route back and forth between what can be automated and what can be delivered by software and what really needs to be delivered by a human. Also, by the way, supported through software. <clears throat> Right. And, and by the way, a little off topic, but Nicole is also a pilot. So one of my, um, one of my, one of my sort of like enterprise bucket list things is someday she'll fly me either to or from a, from a show, but that's for another time. There's, there's no shows to fly to at the moment. So we'll put that aside for now. Um, one, one thing, one thing I would, one thing I would say, um, Thomas, Thomas is, is got the snark engine on, on high, but that's fine. Thomas, that's, that's why you're here. Um, and, uh, is is the way I look at it, Thomas, and at the risk of offending some CX vendors out there, um, I think it's really that CX at its best is a mentality throughout the organization. And I think it implies dramatic organizational change that most companies have not done, including by the way, the software vendors that sell CX. Mm -hmm. And 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 right now I believe that it can be an overall strategy. But I don't think that software can deliver the entirety of it at the moment. It can deliver a piece of it, as Nicole described. 
So like, like another example for me is like Bank of America, my bank, um, I didn't want to do deposits in person anymore. Now I'm using the mobile app. I had not used that before. It works really well for deposits. Does that make my entire relationship with Bank of America frigging awesome? No, it does not. But that one thing, it does well. And I think what, what, what companies are doing right now is they're biting off chunks of that and, and doing a better job on chunks of it. And maybe eventually they'll get more of it right. You know, Amazon gets a lot of it right, but they still have weak links if you have, mm-hmm. for example, if you're exploiting low-cost delivery people that don't know where the hell you, you live. And so then you have then you have a disconnect. But but so anyway, so that's the thing is I think you, you bite off a chunk and then you add more and more. That's how I look at it. So um, anyway, um, we have exhausted all the questions in the queue, but I'm sure there will be more. So don't don't hesitate. Um, this is the only uh, video show I know of that answers every question. So be, be forewarned if you put your question in. Here we go. All right, Nicole, you ready for um, we're on number two, right? Yep. Let's see your number two. All right, and of course, I forgot to write them down because I'm okay. Well, let's hear your number two. Everybody, it is leakage. Now, leakage. either the funnel or revenue leakage. Okay. Ooh. Okay. I mean, seriously, talk about a euphemism. What the hell? Um, first of all, if you're talking about leakage in the funnel sense, uh, do we need to go back to this whole thing that the funnel is is a fundamental fallacy of how? people actually buy stuff in the first place. It's not about a funnel. Revenue leakage is another interesting one because it implies one of two things. Either you didn't manage to get a customer to buy something that you expected them to buy, or you didn't bother collecting their money for it. So, you know, both of those things indicate something that is really kind of bizarrely disjointed from customers and what matters to customers and what they're actually doing. Um, And it's far more reflective, I think, of uh, fundamental breakdown and internal operations, but also a failure to understand what's happening with customers and what really matters to them. Mm. It sounds to me like a urinary tract infection, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, they have products to help with that too, John. Okay. Now we now now Nicole, we can debate whether this whether you and I are agreeing here with mine or whether this is different. I would argue this is slightly different. And Thomas, are you ready for this one? Yep. And number two, we have (laughs) hyper-personalization. Yep. Now, the distinction I would make here is that I think personalization in some contexts is technically possible. I disagree that hyper-personalization is technically possible. So I'm going to, at least for most companies right now, I have yet to experience it. So, I mean, I experience it from my, like, um, from my, like, local uh, grocery store, because the person there knows me, but that's, I, I've never experienced it at any kind of scale. Maybe you have, maybe it's possible. I don't believe it's possible. So I resent that the term is actually being used. Uh, I had an argument with the PR person about that just the other day. Um, I, 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 I like the idea of it. I, I just don't think it's been achieved yet or has it. And I'm just missing the boat. I, but I think you're, I think you're hitting on a really, really important distinction here, John, which is that, face-to-face, human-to-human relationship. That's what feels personal. That's what is personal. And you can you can feel very positively toward a business, toward an organization. Uh, you can have a strong affinity for them. Um, you can feel like on a broad level that they get you, but it's still not necessarily personal. It's, it's positive, it might be close, but it's not personal personal relationships are fundamentally about people. So I do think you're right. There, there is an inherent limitation and scale there. If we can get all of that affinity and positive feeling right on a larger organizational or institutional scale and match that with some great personal relationships in the right places at the right times, then I think you've got something really cool. But that's not really how the term hyper-personalization is being used today. So, for example, when I think about personalization, like I think about Amazon and how effective like things like also bot recommendations are. And there's all kinds of studies now that prove that that kind of related you know, recommendations do drive traffic. YouTube does a very good job with with the videos that it displays, um, though it thinks I'm a Trump supporter. That's a long story. Um, well, TikTok but, is a good example of that, right? Serving yeah. up stuff likely to enjoy but yeah yeah and and tiktok i from what i research and i'm not a tiktok user 
they may be about as close to the hyper part of hyper personalization as I've heard of. Their algorithm is very sophisticated. Anyone who hasn't read up on that, I would encourage you to do that. This is one time where I can't plug Diginomica because we have not written about TikTok. Uh, but actually, I think we may have one piece, but it doesn't touch on this. Um, but 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 yeah, I, I I think I think it's possible to get there someday. But what I see right now that works, I would call personalization. But I resent the hyper. I don't I don't think companies have earned the right to use it yet. No, so. I think you're right. It's, it's like let's jump to warp speed because we haven't really figured out how to do supersonic at any consistent passenger level yet. You know. Okay, so I do want to get to our top five CX project tips. So why don't we blast through the final buzzword with a, right. with a drum roll here? Let's hear your number one. Uh, this, I'm sure, will not come as any big surprise to you, John. It is experience management. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. So what, what gets under your craw about experience management? And again, I've written about this. It was a while ago. It was early early last year, so almost two years ago. But I check, really check the, check the Constellation Research blog, folks, and you can there. see it. It's there. But I have a fundamental problem with ordinarily what this term suggests. This term suggests that you can manage someone else's experiences. And that is just fundamentally untrue. You can try to shape them. You can try to stack the deck in favor of ensuring the odds that what you would like someone to experience is indeed what they experience. I mean, Disneyland, right? Or Disney World. This is this is an exercise in very much trying to shape people's experiences. But if you're the kid whose ice cream just fell on the ground while you're in line outside waiting to go on Pirates of the Caribbean, that does not ensure that you're going to have a positive experience of Pirates of the Caribbean. because Or, is, or if you're the parent of that kid. Exactly, exactly. Right. You dollars on that ice cream while you were waiting in line. Yeah, so, so this is the deal. We can't manage anyone else's experiences, nor should we try. What we can do is try to do our best to design in order to shape the outcomes, to shape the experiences that we would like our customers to have, small or large. But let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we can manage them. And I also think this gets applied to platforms around things like experience, like uh, not we get the experience management platform term, but it's really around managing assets. Uh, managing the way that we tailor what we present to someone based on what we know about them or what we anticipate. That's not managing an experience. That's managing information. That's managing assets. That's managing some of our interactions, but it's not really managing experiences. And you can argue that I'm being a little bit of a pedant here around terminology, but I think these things matter because the way that our employees understand what we're trying to do is ultimately a function of the language we use to describe it. And you know what? Words matter. So Thomas wants to know how you would call that category of software. Ah, that's a longer debate. I wish I had a great label for it. Um, but I, I do think- well, Thomas is, is firing, isn't firing any blanks today, no, man. No, not pulling punches, no. I think it depends because the other problem is that a lot of stuff gets lumped under this heading of experience management. And it's really, again, not apples to apples comparisons. So you have some stuff that's like voice of the customer or managing everything that you've gotten in terms of feedback from customers. Uh, sometimes you've got stuff that is really quite literally like what ads and what, what messages get served up to individual customers. <laughs> I'm glad to know I'm in good company. Um, it's, it's a wide range of things. And that label gets applied very broadly and it's very rarely explained in any specific detail until you really start twisting somebody's arm behind their backs to, to explain what they mean. Got it. So my number one, I guess I'm going to ring the bell for this, but it's a little questionable. I'm going just with the word experience and there's a frowny face underneath. <laughs> um, and this is a little bit, hypocritical of me because this is one one buzzword that I actually do use sometimes um, and I haven't figured out a way around that. I, I just want to just briefly explain my issue with the word experience. Uh, I had one vendor tell me, I like your stuff on virtual events, though I prefer to call them virtual experiences. And I was thinking to myself, I've been to some of your virtual events and nothing personal because most vendors are, are putting on terrible events. 
but it was actually a bad experience. And I think the problem with the word experience is that it's always implied that it's a good experience. Yep. And a lot of times experiences are actually negative. Yep. And so I think it's really, really important to d- establish a different context around it. And also, I I like thinking about experiences as one of several potential goals you could provide customers, depending on your brand's agenda and the type of customers you serve, right? So, um, I mean, I guess you could argue that efficiency is an experience of sorts, but like, you know, like when I order stuff from Amazon, I'm just looking to get in and out. Um, I'm not looking for a special experience, quote unquote. Um, so that's part of thing. I think you can compete on other things besides experience. And so I just like to push back against it a little bit. It's I don't fundamentally object to it because I understand what they're trying to say. I, I, I know what they I know what companies mean when they use the word. I just feel like it just needs to be problematized a little bit more is all. So. Yeah, well, I think what you're pointing to is, again, how we interpret words, how we interpret their meanings, and it's the the connotation as opposed to the actual definition. I mean, one of my favorite sort of um, counterfactuals on customer experience and competing on customer experience is Ryanair. Anyone who's lived in Europe has probably right. come across Ryanair and maybe has flown with them. Um, they are universally known for having an absolutely shitty approach to customer service. Their their unspoken motto is pretty much, you know, F off, give us your money and we'll get you there maybe, you know. And it's kind of funny because their customers know that. I mean, they're cheap. They're cheap for a reason. There was a point, and I think that they never actually intended to do this, but it certainly made headlines. There was a point where they were considering putting um, – little coin slots on the lavatories on the planes so that if you wanted to use one, you actually had to pay money to use the lavatory while you were in flight. So, you know, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we sort of popularly joke about. The fact of the matter is Ryanair absolutely is competing on experience. They compete on the fact and they they set the expectation that the experience is going to be lousy, but <laughs> that it's going to be inexpensive, you know, and that is why customers go to them. And, and the thing is, funnily enough, if it's not the worst experience you've ever had, you kind of come away with it going, hey, actually, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, and we and we could have a long, silly debate about it because in a way they're more competing on price in a sense, I would argue. But I understand what you mean. You, you, there, there's a part where you kind of it, – it's like the importance of having that intimate knowledge of your customer and, and being clear about it with them and being consistent about it so that they kind of know this is – what I'm going to deal with, you know, but I just think it's interesting how just people are so determined to compete on experiences. And like, so I was thinking, I wrote the other day in a blog about, um, uh, I was, there are these eye drops that were really helping my eyes and they were the only ones that worked. And I started to get panicky because they weren't on the shelves anymore and I couldn't find them online. But I was thinking, uh, you never know, there could be just Corona disruption, right? Well, I spent like 45 minutes figuring out how to contact the manufacturer directly and, and I found out like the deal and I'm going to get some more. So I was really happy, but like, so in, in their case, I would argue they're competing on product. Their, their product is, is so exceptional. I, I didn't get off the phone and say, gosh, I really resent the fact that I had to spend an hour. I was so happy to know they were still in production that it, it was great for me. So like, I just think like, it's just important for us to have a more, I'm, I'm not saying we have to ban the word. I just want to have a more complicated discussion around it. Yeah, nuance, nuance is key. I think we totally wholeheartedly agree on that one. Yeah, R- Mark's heard that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was Mark. That's my that's my bet for sure. Okay, all right. So shall we move on to our our top five keys to successful projects? Absolutely. Um, and and part of this is is the show philosophy, which is that we don't get to snark the whole time. We have to also talk about things that that we're seeing that hopefully inspire us, because frankly, we need some of that, especially now. Um, and I think ultimately that's why we're in this business, right? Is to create better projects and to be a part of better solutions for people. So, Nicole. Yeah. Give me your, okay. give me give me give me one of your keys to successful CX project. We'll start with your number five. Well, and, and so here's where I overperformed on this one. So I'm going to give you one context setting idea, and then I'm going to focus on the actual advice to how to make okay. CX projects work. That, that'll work. 
That'll work. Context setting advice is think about customers in everything that you're doing in a CX project. And particularly, and this is my, my really big sort of golden nugget around this, think of customers as individuals and do as much as you can to understand individual customers because it is very easy and very useful to generalize from specifics it is very dangerous and the the road to misfortune to try to infer specifics from generalizations. So the more you know about your actual customers, the better off you are. And the more you're striving to know and to continuously use that to shape what you're doing. So that's my context setting. With that in mind, um, the first point I'd offer is focus on who's using the systems and make them easy for those folks because adoption is absolutely the key to success with any of these systems because increasingly they're designed to be self-reinforcing. So the more that people are using the systems, the more value there are in the systems and the better life gets for everybody involved. So adoption, key. So focus on who's using them. I love it. In fact, I'm typing this into my show notes because I'm mad at myself because that's better than any of my top five. So <laughs> I, 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 I take it back. That's uh, that's 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 absolutely uh, adoption is everything now with 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 this type of software. Um, and if you don't have that, you have nothing. Oh, that's uh, we've already done that comment. OK, cool. Um, my number five is uh, these are a little harder to read. But anyhow, um, employees first. And notice yep. I did not notice I did not say employee experience. Uh, I am not hopping on the ex- employee experience train, but I just think companies would be really surprised if if they actually put their employees at the core of these projects. What kind of results they would get? Happy employees, happy customers. We can we can adapt that from some domestic sayings. Yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, and uh, and I think it it really does apply. And you know it. It, it's important to realize too that there are issues there because so for example like I've, I've had a number of conversations on show floors about this where where companies see a technological solution to that so in other words the customer comes into a store and they know more about the product than ever before and the employees mismatched because the employee doesn't have that so the yeah. idea the idea is can we level that off by arming employees with with better tools of engagement that have more information, maybe even information on customers and stuff like that. I, I'm all for that. It makes all kinds of sense. But the idea that you can totally transform how an employee feels about your organization by by putting technology in their hands or giving them an app is ludicrous to me. If you're still underpaying them, if you're still giving them bad benefits, if you're still expecting them to work, even if they've tested positive, which by the way is not, I'm not making that up. No, um, I- I know. Hey, healthcare workers right there at the front, at the pointy end of that one. Right. So, so the point being like, the point being like employees first and, and then let's see how your customer project goes from there. I'll bet it'll go a lot better. Yeah. Well, so we're very much aligned with our advice on that one, John. Um, And I'll say too, you know, we're talking about tools. You can use tools effectively. You can use tools ineffectively. So to your point, yeah, it's it's not about the tools alone. Absolutely not. Okay, what's your four? Uh, paid pilots. So this is one of those things that I think we don't talk enough about when it comes to technology implementation projects. And you know, I've got to say, I compare my time as an analyst many moons ago when I was a Gartner, and you know, some things have really changed quite considerably. And one of those, I believe, is the evaluation and selection process because things have to move at a much faster pace than they did 20 years ago. Paid pilots are a really good way of doing that because you get at least two things out of it. One is, especially if you're using real data, which I strongly recommend, um, one is you get effectively the starter, the seed project for an implementation if it goes well. Um, if it doesn't go well, you've invested some money, but you've probably also figured out some really important things that you need to do differently, whether it's about the product or the the way that you've framed the project or the objectives that you have, you're going to learn from that in a way that you wouldn't learn by just doing a sort of arm's length selection process. If you do end up going forward, you've got a real head start when it comes to actual implementation and rollout. Cool. 
and, and by the way, Thomas, I know you've been on a lot of these projects. So if you have a top uh, tip for successful projects, please put that into the chat. I just featured your comment there as well. Um, my number four is is industry partners and in or and or independent advisor. So uh, I think CX is too often viewed as a generic horizontal play. I think it's really important to team up with partners that understand your industry and how can help you make apples to apples comparisons with other companies that are surging ahead in your industry and what they're doing right and what you might be doing wrong. Yep. And I think a lot of times customers are still too prevalent to go with whatever consulting partner they used in the past and not look as much to specialists. I would just look look for specialists, either whether, I don't care if it's a large firm or small firm, find people that really know your industry, not just CX or not just CRM software or whatever you want to call it. And, and the independent advisor thing might go in hand in hand with that or not, which is make sure you're not just dependent on one partner, but you have someone in the mix who can give a different perspective and give you some gut checks as you go. So that's my number four. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Okay. Right. Number three, Nicole. Uh, Cross-functional teams. Uh, I don't know Ooh. if you heard me say this earlier in this conversation. CX, it's an enterprise-wide team sport. So I, I think it's hard to find a CX project where you don't benefit from having some cross-functional teams that are involved throughout the process. Because you know whoever's taking the lead, whoever is the primary beneficiary, or whoever is really managing whatever system or, or tool that you're implementing, inevitably you're touching on different parts of the organization. And having those stakeholders involved from the outset is really going to smooth the path. And it's gonna ensure that you anticipate things from a much earlier stage and it doesn't end up being a problem once you've already rolled it out, you've actually designed it into whatever you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, Thomas, you're wondering why number five is not number one. I'm not sure who you're referring to, but what I can tell you is these are tough calls, man. These, They're all, all, all these, all these five are, these are, these are tough ones, man. And it, it could change tomorrow. This is kind of based on my review of the stuff I did today. Um, so I, Absolutely, they could be others. Let's um let's see what Tom let's see what Thomas has to say here. Yeah. Uh, some of my other key points are think big, act small. Do pilots come from the user side of the house? So you have a consensus on your pilot suggestion there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think on the cross-functional teams too, because that's that's really the user side of the house. In in other words, I think to a large degree. Yeah, and you know, I didn't put this on the list, but there's definitely I'm, I'm going to put this in my show notes. But there's there's definitely I think a growing consensus with any of these projects that you need to have quick wins that build momentum, and so that kind of ties into Thomas's point. You, you know, but you want those wins to be in the context of an overall strategy as well, right? So you're not just latching on to oh, we need to do a commerce project for yeah. for co for COVID reasons. Like you should have some long-term sort of agenda and strategy behind it. Yep. Mark liked the uh, part partner system thing. Oh, Mark, I'm not sure what the plug is there, but anyhow, uh, there's your plug. Uh, okay. Um, my number three is uh, kind of ties into yours. Actually it's backend connectivity um, inventory. So it's that this is kind of probably obvious at this point, but you know, uh, I, I did some use cases on this, but it's really hard to do these projects, especially with real time availability issues without having insight into your back end systems. And so yep. um, this sort of, in fact, we probably need to destroy this whole front office, back office sort of meaningless d divide now because it's all tied together. If you want to serve people properly, they want your, your customers and your suppliers want visibility all the way into your back end as part of these projects. Amen. Yep, Absolutely. All right, so I'm going for my, what am I on, number two now? And by yeah, the way- Yeah, you're on number two, yeah. I've done this list in reverse order just as easily. So Thomas, to your point, um, minimum viable. So getting to, I think what we just sort of hinted at, start with the minimum viable. It doesn't have to be all encompassing, but yes, mm -hmm. this is how you get to those initial results that actually help you to drive any further change forward. So, you know, it, it is absolutely a kind of jargony term that certainly comes out of software development, but I think it is a really useful concept. So just as agile has kind of taken over the world, I think minimum viable is actually, and, and importantly, taking over our views of how we 
do these kinds of technology, particularly technology implementation projects? Absolutely. Okay, my number two, automation for ROI, not just cost cutting. So uh, this came out of a conversation I had actually today uh, and, um, and, and also yesterday about chatbots and the role of bots in customer service. And, and, and I think there is actually some promise for bots to really help with low level customer service delivery issues. Uh, so for example, like password resets, uh, handling routine returns, things like that. If, if they're well-designed and you can escalate properly, it can work. But what I worry about is people using things like that, various forms of automation, as simply a form of cost control and efficiency and headcount reduction and not thinking about, well, what does this mean? If, if I can reduce the load on my, on my service operators, what can they be doing that's different to serve customers better, to make a difference with my most important customers, or even so-called creating things of value? Can, you know, can, can, they, can they serve on, on new business model transitions we're working on? So I always want to hear both parts of that conversation. I don't want to just hear about automation for automation's sake. Even if it brings a bottom line benefit, that's ultimately not good enough for me in the long run. So, Well, just to pick up on your bots example, because I think it's a great one. If you're doing that right, let's say it's a customer service bot. What you're doing is you're giving yourself a pipeline into customer issues and questions. And you may not be able to answer all of them via the bot, but that is a huge and incredibly valuable source of information about what matters to your customers. So if you aren't also thinking of that when you implement them, you're missing a really huge chunk of that ROI that you just mentioned, John. Got it. All right. We're on to number one. Nicole, what's your number right. one? Number one is going to sound a little pedestrian, I think, after all the stuff we've talked about, but it's iterative rollouts. And again, I come back to this idea that, you know, we're constantly changing and adapting. And I think if there's one thing we've learned this year is that priority, priorities can sometimes change very dramatically and very quickly. And if you are in this kind of iterative rollout mentality, that means you can adapt as those priorities change and you don't risk being really hugely off course to what matters to the business, to your employees and to your customers. So really don't think we can put too much emphasis on this idea of iteration, iteration and continuously, you know, continuously building on what you've already got. Absolutely. <clears throat> My number one is measure the right things, move beyond volume metrics. Yes. So one of my big things is, well, how do you know you've had a successful project? Well, you have to measure it. And this is where the trouble begins. <laughs> Because just because you can measure certain things and apply KPIs to certain things doesn't mean you're measuring the right things. And I think too often we still get caught up in these volume metrics. Yeah. And oh, we responded to so many service calls, or we, you know, we answered so many customer questions in the queue and blah, blah, blah. Maybe not the best metrics. So yeah. how do we define the ones that are really going to make a difference for our business? And there's so many interesting discussions. I just did a piece a little while ago about about um, SaaS metrics because like churn, for example, is obvious, you don't want churn, but there's there's actually many different kinds of churn. And some of them are really concerning. Some of them are like unavoidable churn, right? Like business goes under during the pandemic, that probably wasn't your fault, right? So that's churn, but it probably wasn't. Of, so the point being, there's yeah. a lot of fine tuning that has to be done here. And, and I wish companies would talk with people like yourself um, and and figure out how they're going to assess things when they're done and, and what are the best ways to evaluate it, right? So anyway. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think a lot of times we have metrics because they're things that we can measure, not because they're meaningful or not because okay. they're the things that really matter. It's just that they're there. And that unfortunately can be a really big misdirect. My favorite blog post on Diginomica that I've ever written, I think, maybe has 175 lifetime views, which is not a ginormous. I don't care. It was a great blog. If you missed it, you suck. It was really good. It was about deep work and the importance of deep work uh, for individuals defining their careers. It was, in, in my defense, it was it was right after we started. So we, we didn't have big readership then. But anyway. We should so, come oh, back. I think we should come back to John. I think there's a yeah, lot yeah. of uh, Thomas. That was a blast to have you here. 
really, really excellent viewpoints from you because you really know this stuff inside and out. I encourage folks to follow Thomas and his gang also does CRM video shows on LinkedIn, by the way. So check him out. Bye, Thomas. Catch you later. And Mark, excellent point. Once you go down the volume metrics pass, it is tough to get off that train. Mark knows this well. Mark, Mark's going to eventually join me on a show to talk about some of this stuff from a community perspective. But uh, he, Mark's an expert in building enterprise communities, amongst other things. And that's, a, that's an area where all the time you measure this in the wrong way and you get yourself into a whole lot of trouble. So um, that's a that's whole really separate good. episode, I think, John, is the value versus volume conversation. Oh, absolutely. I had some honorable mentions. One of them was uh, come up for air more often, iterative projects. So yeah. I'll give my, we'll give myself one bell ring for that, even though I didn't include it in my top five, but I think you totally nailed that one. Um, I also had um, um, this this one, I mean, talk about bordering, bordering on the bloody obvious, but I had learn from your peers, um, yeah. you know, online and user groups. And the only reason I wanted to kind of bring that out is because even though events have been disrupted, your process of learning from your peers should not be disrupted. So, you know, I, I talk a lot about how the best professionals build the best networks for themselves. And I think that that's true now more than ever. And so, and I think that ends up applying to your projects also. And it's not just your peers, obviously, it might be people like yourself or, or Thomas or, you know, whatever, maybe even me, whatever. The point is you, you connect with people, you make yourself smarter. They People that challenge your thinking, you need those people in your life. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think probably what's changed is that we need to formalize the way that we do that now more than we used to because you have to really schedule time. It's not like you bump into someone in the corridors of, you know, yeah. one of the conferences that you and I both attend and used to spend time hanging out at. So it is, it is something that requires a little bit more concerted effort. But I don't know about you. I always come away from those conversations incredibly energized and refreshed. Yeah. And honestly, my favorites are the ones, it, it, these are really hard to simulate online, but like, like the dinners where you're sitting like next to an executive on one hand, there's a customer on the other, there's an analyst across from you, there's a couple of partners and, and you're all having this super engaging conversation and you realize like, like, Quit, quit like demonizing like various stakeholders and realize like everyone's got to solve this together. And when you have those conversations, you're like, oh my God, how you simulate that virtually? Well, that's another conversation, but you start by making the connections. So um, yeah, yeah. I had, by the way, three honorable mention buzzwords, which I'll share with you in the group. We don't need to go into them, but um, predictive signal was one that was bothering me. Um, I do like customer, signal, but yes. What's that? I do like the idea of signals because I do think there's something really important. Oh, it's important. It just, uh, it just. I know yeah, I'm, with, yeah. I'm with you. That, that, that's yeah. going to end up in the, in the trash basket basket of ridiculous jargon pretty quickly. And I had customer journey mapping on there. Um, that, that just brings up bile, even though I, I do think it's important to understand your customers. Yeah. Um, and then I also had, um, Growth hacking, which appeared on the CX list I was looking at, which isn't really a CX term, but when I saw it, I was like, what the hell is growth hacking? Um, it sounds actually kind of violent. Um, <laughs> it, it does. It makes, it makes me scary. Crappy, but, you know, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, the connotations there are not awesome. So um, I promised you a chance for, for whiffs here. Uh like in my column, this show is roughly modeled after my enterprise hits and misses column. And uh, we're, we each get to do an off topic um, a whiff of the week. Um, and uh, you, you have one that might, might be a little controversial, but I'm going to let you do it. Uh, yeah. Because, because, because you know what? This is the life we're living. So here you go. Well, thanks, John. Um, I know you don't typically venture into this territory, nor do I. But I just got to say, the big whiff for me this week, and it was so big, it was hard for me to see anything else, is the absolute denial of reality to acknowledge election results. I think that's a pretty big one. There's a point at, where, at which you just have to acknowledge and move on for your benefit and, and everyone else's. Yeah, I mean, mark me down for peaceful transitions of power um, as part of democracy. So I'm, I'm really, really good for that one. Uh, I, I have some whiffs in, in, in my, in my column this week that were kind of fun. Um, one that came up on Twitter, uh, that kind of related to yours, uh, 
Den Hallett was, uh, my colleague from Diginomica was talking about how Americans can sometimes be a little bit um, slow on the draw as far as understanding American history. So I put out this thing about how um, 32% of Americans can name all three branches of government, which I think actually has gone up from previous years. Uh. Um, and, and then I actually said that, um, that I think the percentage is higher for those that know the name of all the Kardashian siblings. I think you're probably right. I, I um, hate to say it, but I would be willing to bet that you're right. And, and finally, from, from Hits and Misses uh, last week, uh, one of my favorites was um, that I um, one of the best PR pitches I've got in a while. I can't think of too many worse phrases to lead off a PR pitch than with me than the dawn of Kubernetes, unless you make a full poem out of it. And God, God bless my followers. Um, a couple of them created poems. Um, I saw that. I saw that. Inclu- I including, <laughs> yeah, including Josh Greenbaum, I believe, and also um, Ron Miller, uh, who uh, said, "Twas the night before containerization at the dawn of Kubernetes, the day after Docker, and the fleeting moment of Mesos." Bravo, Ron Miller of TechCrunch. You you nailed it. Thank you for actually doing a Kubernetes poem for me. That that definitely made my week. So, I get. I've got to add, John, just my little bit of trivia on on Kubernetes. If you, if you follow the pronunciation guidance in the dictionary. Um, so I don't know if you know this or how many people watching this do, but uh, that is a name derived from the ancient Greek for Kubernetes, who was the oarsman. So oh. it really is about steering through all this stuff, which I thought actually was pretty interesting. Came across that in all of my rabbit hole following on unified systems theory. Thank you very much. It is a cool name, yeah. Kubernetes. And I guess if you sprinkle it onto a project, magical things do happen. So uh, some people is, will agree with you, and some people will not. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, yeah, uh, that 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 was a sar- sarcastic joke. Sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> but that that's that's another show, probably Kubernetes. Anyhow, uh, it's been a blast, Nicole. Thanks for being a willing early participant in my format evolution. I hope you yeah. had fun. Always a pleasure, anytime. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, folks. We'll see you next week. I'm not sure what I'm doing yet. I think Brian Summer might be coming back because you guys were demanding some more Brian Summer, but we'll see. Thanks, everyone. Bye.